As podcasting continues to explode in popularity, more and more podcasters are expanding into video to reach wider audiences. But is taking on both mediums the right strategy for every show creator? Welcome to the Podcasting Secrets Show, where successful creators share their best stories, secrets, and strategies. I'm your host, Nathan Gwilliam. Hello, incurable creators. In this episode, I am joined by Rob Greenlee. Rob is the founder of Spoken Life Media, and he has had a prolific career working for many uh, leading podcasting-related companies. Uh, for example, he served as the Vice President of Content and Partnerships at Libsyn. He was the Head of Partnerships at Spreaker. Um, he's the, the co-host of the podcast, uh, The New Media Show, uh, where he discusses trends and news from the podcasting world. Uh, he recently launched Podcast Tips with Rob Greenlee on StreamYard, and he's even the former chairperson of the Podcast Academy, which is the Ambies Award. Thank you so much for joining us on this episode, Rob. Well, thank you for having me. I, I appreciate you inviting me to join you, um, Nathan. It's great to be on your show. Absolutely. And in this episode, we're going to have a discussion about the convergence of audio and video strategy. And it's, it's really interesting. I talk about podcasting with people, and, and uh, podcasting, if you look up the definition, technically means recording and publishing an audio file. But it feels like more and more that term is becoming synonymous with creating content and publishing it in numerous different ways, including audio, but also video and social and newsletters and blogs and in a lot of different ways. Um, tell me about how you've seen that kind of transformation of, of the term podcasting and, and kind of all that it encompasses. Yeah, let me take you back a little bit further. If you go back to the earlier days of the podcasting medium itself, um, it was an audio and video medium. So that definition that you're quoting there is is fairly recent around the perception of podcasting. And because back in the, uh, let's say the 2007, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 timeframe, um, podcasting was probably 30% video podcasting, which was the same thing as audio. So you could put an audio file in an RSS feed, or you can put a video file in an RSS feed. The standard is open to even PDF files. So, you know, it's in the past, it was more common for people than it is now for a person to publish a video file into a separate RSS feed from a audio file in a, another RSS feed. So you could have the same program that was available in Apple Podcasts, which you can do even today, um, that would be an audio version and a video version, and you can um, consume your choice. You can pick what medium that you want to consume it in. So when, when YouTube launched approximately 2007 or so um, and started to grow, a lot of those video podcasters um, started to publish their episodes over to, to YouTube. And so we saw kind of a decline in the amount of video podcasters um, because of YouTube. And so to kind of come full circle with this, we went through an era, like the last 10 years or so, um, where the medium has perceived to be primarily podcasting as an audio medium. But it really hasn't always been that way. Um, so in some ways, this convergence conversation that we're talking about today is almost like going back to the origins of this, th this medium to look at podcasting as a more complete um, kind of open syndication distribution um, technology or platform or, or wh whatever you want to call it. If you look at some of the early podcast hosting platforms like Ellipson, Podbean, Blueberry, they still support video podcasting today. So my new media show that you mentioned has been a video and audio podcast um, since, well, since about 2013 or something like that. So it's, it's been active in that area. And there were whole media companies that were created in the early days of podcasting that were just doing video podcasts. And some of those companies sold to like big networks like the Discovery Channel, um, and some of those. So there's a whole other era of this podcast medium because it's 20 years old, right? It's been yeah. around a while. Uh, so it's gone through a lot of evolutions. And if you weren't around back then, paying attention to the medium, you probably wouldn't know any of this. So that's 
that's why we're, we're seeing what's happened today and why I'm talking about this convergence is that we're kind of coming back to the origins to some degree. But it is, to many people, it is a significant development because it is like what you just said, is that podcasting is being seen by audiences as an as a, um, online content distribution strategy, right? Not so much entirely linked to RSS, which historically has been the case. But now we're starting to see uh, people perceive podcasting in platforms like YouTube and whatever as being podcast. And guess what YouTube has done is they've named um, some of that content to be podcast in their platform, which is only kind of propelling that uh, perception. Okay, so let's talk about this convergence. Maybe you could start off by just giving a, a high-level overview. What What is the convergence of audio and, and video strategy and podcasting and, and kind of what's driving it? Yeah, I think that the big thing is just looking at it um, from a more complete perspective, right, of some people like to consume audio, some people like to consume video. And if you're creating a program or a show, um, you know, it it's an optional strategy to, to look at that and say, well, can I make this video show good for video consumption? And can I also take that same show and put it out as an audio version as well? And how do I do that? What's that approach that I need to make? And what do I need to think about in being able to produce a piece of content that is useful in a audio and video consumption experience? And then also, how can I take that content that I'm making and make it available in other tools and other platforms like a TikTok or, or Reels or um, in Spotify or whatever. And that's kind of where the audience is perceiving. And this is really what we're talking about here is more of a what the audience is perceiving that this content is, is that it, if you're doing a program like what we're doing here, that doesn't have an RSS feed distribution strategy behind it, but it's only available in like Spotify. Just look at, uh, I mean, a great example of this is Joe Rogan. Joe Rogan started out as a podcast, audio only, started getting into video, and then he did a licensing deal with Spotify to put his program only exclusively on Spotify. And guess what he's done inside of Spotify? He's created a convergence strategy. He's kind of kept that going, actually, is what, what, yeah. what he's actually done. But he still has his RSS feed um, account with Lipson, but he's not using it, right? So he doesn't need to use it because he's on an exclusive distribution deal with Spotify. So many in the podcasting space look at Joe Rogan and say, well, he's actually technically not a podcast, right? Because he doesn't have an RSS feed. He has no need for an RSS feed. So, but people still consider him to be the biggest podcaster in the world. So that's an example of what I'm talking about, about convergence, right? These people are perceiving things as a type of a content. And I've been arguing this point for many years is that progressively we have been seeing this development that the audiences are driving the perception of the medium, not the content creators. The content creators kind of get caught up in this. It's like, well, I don't need to know about RSS or, or I need to know about RSS. It kind of goes both ways. My contention now is that it's all content. It's what the audience perceives is what's most important. Yeah, definitely that perception is driving it. Let's talk about the whys for a second. Why are some people not adopting this convergence with video and audio? And why should we? What are the biggest benefits that should be driving us in this direction? Yeah, I think it's a, it's a very good question, actually, because I think as a content creator and as a person that's um, thinking about getting involved in creating online content, I think you do need to think about what um, what your passion is and what you want to do, right, is a big part of this, right? Um, especially if you're just getting started, um, video can be a challenging medium, right? You, many people feel like that they have to build up to that. And then there's other people that are very talented on video, right, that can just jump right in. And so we've kind of seen this approach, and you can clearly see it in in YouTube, is that there's very talented people on YouTube that are just so good on camera and they just have natural talent in that way that they tend to just gravitate towards that and do that only. And oftentimes they don't think about just putting out an audio version of it because they built such a following in YouTube and that's working for them. Um, but then there's other people that feel, you know, shy or 
don't want to put their face out on video and don't feel confident in that, that maybe they feel more confident in just doing audio to get started, right? Or to do audio because they feel like they can create the best kind of content because they can do post-production editing more and and things like that. Because editing video can be a little more challenging and it also can be punishing uh, in the the um, consumption experience if you do too much editing, right? So, so, but in audio, you can do as much editing as you want, uh, right? So it's all about how you want to create content, what you feel comfortable doing, and what your topic is, and what's, what's the demographic breakdown of what that content is. Um, YouTube consumption tends to be younger, though I think it's, it's moving a little older, and podcasting is tending to be the fastest growing um, demographic, age demographic is young people. Like 16 to 24 is the fastest growing consumption demographic for podcasts. Um, and, and radio obviously tends to be a lot older. So you ha- have that demographic piece of it too. But we're not really talking about radio. But, but radio is an interesting contrast to what's happening in podcasting right now and why we're seeing a lot of um, people moving away from radio going towards more on-demand and podcasting experiences. So, so it really gets back to what you want to do. What are your passions? What are your goals? Um, what do you feel comfortable with? What do you have knowledge of already? And, um, and then build up to these different uh, strategies, right? So this convergence strategy is probably the best way to go um, if you know how to do it and you feel confident and have the time to do it. Because it, 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 it is a time commitment to do both of these things and to do them well. Um, but it can be very effective in some of the very largest content creators and some of the most successful ones um, do a convergence strategy and have been doing it for many years. Let me do an aside really quick and just comment on something you just said. You, you were talking about, about radio and mm-hmm. now we're not talking about radio here, but I'm seeing a lot of convergence with radio into this audio video. Uh, I've mm-hmm. personally worked with with multiple uh, very popular radio hosts um, mm-hmm. who who are seeing the need that they're gonna they're having to go to podcast and they're to audio and to video and and they well, are they making need to. That transition. Right. Yeah, right. They are the radio is converging with this audio video convergence as well. Well, because they want to stay relevant um, as the, as, as the demographics of media change, um, they need to be following that, that trend. And that, that's kind of what's happening with, with radio right now. It's, it, it's not like they're falling off a cliff right now, but it's, it's gradually changing as the demographic consumption of media changes. Yeah. And as, more, more older people stop being consumers of radio. Um, the younger people are coming through the pipeline and they're, they're adopting the new on-demand or live streaming or streaming technology platforms um, increasingly, which is eroding their market share. Yeah, definitely. Okay, you also were talking about some of the challenges that hosts, that creators are facing as they, they try to implement this, this conversion, this audio and video together into their platform. And uh, maybe you can talk a little bit more about some of those challenges. What are some of the most common challenges and, and what are some of the best ways to overcome those? Well, I think some of the biggest challenges is just um, figuring out what the best way is to get started. <clears throat> you know, if you have a lot of um, online content experience coming from a prior job or, you know, if you worked in media or something like that, or if you were an online uh, presenter and you've done a lot of Zoom type um, content uh, or just been on a lot of Zoom calls uh, for, for, for your job and you have decent recording equipment and good webcam and a good camera, I think, or, or, or a good, good microphone or one that at least picks up good sound, I think you have the good foundation to get started with this. Th- then it just really boils down to what's your distribution and syndication strategy is. And then obviously the content, you know, it's the why, it's what's your message, what are you trying to build for yourself is is the other huge component to that. But the biggest challenge is just, for many, it's just getting started and yeah. and really coming up with uh, a, a content 
approach that fits with you, fits with your passions, maybe aligns with your, your personal brand goals, uh, if you even establish those yet, and, and working through kind of a, a little bit of a focus. Now, granted, you don't have to have all this stuff figured out to get started. You know, I think, I think one of the things that a lot of people do is they get binded up in this, um, this dilemma that they get involved in of, of indecision, right, because they can't make up their mind on something. And oftentimes it's better to just get started with um, just a s- simple concept be willing to accept a certain period of time when you're not going to have a large audience. So if you have a small audience at the beginning, then you have less risk, right? So it just depends on where you are in your career and your personal brand, um, how free you are to just enter creating content um, at a maybe a lower level of performance or quality or something like that to get started. Um if you're a high profile personality, you probably need to take it a little bit more seriously at the beginning. But if you're a person that is relatively unknown, uh, I think you can get away with a bunch of experimentation and trying new things because you're not going to be exposed to a lot of people right out of the gate. So, so I think those are the key things to think about, especially at the beginning. Um, and then increasingly we're seeing these new online tools like, like, StreamYard and some of these that are enabling you to just have a webcam and a microphone and then just use their software platform to, to create an account. And you can do live streaming, you can do recording, you can do video, audio, all that stuff into one tool. And you don't have to have a big fancy studio s- set up kind of like what I have here. But, um, but I think those are the biggest things to think about, especially at the beginning. Now, granted, as you move through this process that can be multi-year process, um, there can be challenges that come up, you know, increasingly content creators are faced with I'm trying to figure out if they're going to use, um, AI tools to help them with their post-production or their pre-production or their, or their content planning, things like that. And that's a whole nother level of, of complication. And then where's, where's your content hosted and what platforms do you want to distribute to what's, you know, increasingly content creators are faced with this option of, of um, converting your program into multi-languages. AI is um, giving us the ability to start doing that. Um, And so that could appeal to a much bigger audience, but it does take a different kind of a content syndication strategy. It's a little more of an advanced concept at this point. I think just getting started with your native language is probably the, the safest way to go and the easiest way to go to get started. Yeah, I agree with that. I, I've seen so many people who just get bogged down. They, they can't well, figure so out much, right? exactly the right name, yeah. or they can't figure out exactly, you, you know, change it, right? the equipment. That's, the That's right. You don't need a lot of fancy equipment to get started. You know, I, I may have some of this equipment, but when I travel, you know, next week I'm going to be traveling on the road and, and I'm going to be recording. And, you know, I, I take a few little pieces of equipment and I can still record just fine. Yeah. And, um, you can definitely get started with basic equipment. You can definitely get started, even if you have to change the name of your show. Even if you get 10 or 20 episodes in and you decide you want to go and do something else with your show, um, that's okay. And by getting partway down the road, it'll help you make that decision. Uh, sometimes just doing it is the best way to get where you want to be, not getting where you want to be first before you do it. Yeah. And oftentimes, I mean, you can just start with your smartphone um, and that's got typically a very good video camera in it. And it's got got the ability to bring in high quality audio in there too. And you can just get like a, like a microphone or a lavalier type of a setup that plugs right into your iPhone and um, just keep it really simple. Get a little, you know, like a smartphone tripod stand that you can put on your desk and get a little you know, inexpensive kind of light. Um, like I have like studio lights above me that are, that are creating this balanced look with my background and things like that. So that's kind of advanced concepts. I mean, but you can do that in front of like an open window or something like that, um, that gives you that, that, that light that's very similar to a, to a studio light. Uh, so there, there is inexpensive ways that you can get started with this. And a lot of the platforms are increasingly supporting mobile content production and, and live streaming through your mobile phone. So you can do a lot of this stuff um, with the equipment you probably have right now. Let's not make it too complicated. Just, just yeah, get it right. started. That's right. Yeah. Um, okay. 
Can you share with us some examples of people that have have been very successful in this convergence of audio and video? Well, I think um, there are examples of them out there. I know that there's. I, I think if you go to if you go to YouTube, uh, there are a bunch of shows in there, and so, sometimes it's you know if you get attached to a particular video podcast that is doing you know content kind of like what we are that's a little bit long form. Um, pop over to the Apple Podcasts platform and do a search for their show name and see if they're in there. Um, you know, what we are seeing is that increasingly those, those folks that are building successful programs on YouTube um, are tending to start thinking about audio distribution. And maybe you would prefer to consume that program that's on YouTube um, as an audio show. M maybe you can listen in your car or wh whatever, if you like the content. Now, granted, if and what the big difference is really between these two mediums is how visual they are, right? How much information is being communicated in the visual side versus the audio only side. And that's what the content creator has to really think about as it appeals to a listener is, is you know, that you're, you're giving both sides the same value as much as you can. Now, granted, it's never going to be exactly the same because there's no way of being able to replace, you know, facial expressions and, um, and kind of visual kind of um, hand gestures and things like that. You can't replace that in an audio program. And that may be how you, as a, as a human, like to experience people is with that facial expression, because it does communicate a certain amount of either of its authenticity or um, whether this person is believable or if if there's just kind of a kind of a connection there that's at a deeper level than you get with audio, and I think that's that's the I I think some people um, prefer prefer the video. Um, really, I know I. I've increasingly moved that direction myself. Um, I, I consume far more podcasts really on, on YouTube today than I do in Apple Podcasts. Uh, just, just because I like to s sit down in front of a big screen television and consume that content there. But for all intents and purposes, and many of those programs have an audio version of it. Uh, but that's just, that's just me. Um, but that's not how millions of other people are making choices like that. Yeah. Yeah, you're definitely right. There's some huge quality advantages with video where you can connect in a way that's that's harder to do in audio. Uh, and on the flip side of that, some of the advantages with audio are the the multitasking ability, right? When I'm driving. Right, you can be when, doing other things, right? Yeah. When yeah. I'm exercising, right? I can, I can do two things at the same time. Yeah. Okay. What are some of the biggest mistakes you've seen people make with this convergence of audio and video and how do we avoid them? <laughs> well, I think a lot of them, um, happen, um, unintentionally, um, because maybe they weren't fully accepting or understanding of the additional processes and work that goes into it. Right. Um, and I think, you know, you get caught up on, on the video side and that can take a lot of time. And then on the audio side, that takes up a certain amount of time too, especially if you want to create a slightly different version of your show on the audio side than you do on the video side. So oftentimes it requires either separate editing um, on the video than the audio um, because you do have the option to edit um, differently between the audio and the video. But there is platforms out there that will allow you to edit the audio and the video at the same time. Right. And so there is, um, it's a platform called Descript. And I think we're going to see more of that kind of AI integration around, um, content editing going forward where, where there, there will be selections in the software that you can select to remove certain filler words. So like if I say, um, or if I say like this, the AI will recognize those and remove them from the audio and the video. So when you export from these platforms, these AI platforms, your publishable version, the audio will be edited the same way that the video is. 
So there is something compelling about that, but I do think that you have to be careful about that because sometimes if you do too much editing, um, that takes away from the authenticity and the trust of the content too. But the, the counterbalance to that is that you're, you're maybe being, um, I guess, more conscious or uh, more aware of your, your listeners' time and, and not wasting their time with filler words or big silence gaps or things like that, which is a double-edged sword too, because oftentimes, at least, you know, if you think about broadcast radio and a lot of the best kind of hosts, uh, especially solo hosts that tell stories, they like to tell a story and then take a pause, right? For that, that point or that message yeah. to the listener to really have a little bit of time to think about without the next, you know, thing hitting them. And that's the, that's the balance that you have to strike between these editing tools is, is are you trying to drive emotion and reaction from your audience by what you're saying? Um, or are you just trying to crunch it down into the shortest possible amount of time um, right. that you can to save them time? But it may be removing out of it a lot of the emotional impact um, that is possible in the content. So I think that's the juggle that we're having right now. Yeah, definitely. I had not thought about that. that that's a huge negative of using those filler word and and empty space removal AI tools. We've got to be right. careful that the AI doesn't take away the humanness of that right. podcast. Right, and then all of us start sounding like uh, like voice clones. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. right. All right, let's talk about live streaming for a second. Live streaming has become a huge part of this this audio video convergence. Um, what do we need to do to be successful with live streaming uh, in this convergence? Yeah, I think um, I personally really enjoy live, and I always have because I I started creating content on live radio, so I go into a radio station and do it do it live, and had to manage somewhat manage the the audio board. Plus, I had to take you know answer the phone when I got a caller from that was wanting to call in and join the show. Um, so I've done this multitasking thing with live, but and had been doing it for many years, and this. The show that I do, the new media show, has been live um, on all the streaming platforms for, like I said, like ten over ten years. So it's it's something that is picking up steam because it's a way to have an interactive experience with audience, and it's a way to connect with people uh, real time, uh, and it's and it has a certain amount of, I gotta say, it, it's kind of like being a sports athlete where you you know you're in the locker room before the game and you kind of get kind of butterflies and you kind of get excited about, I'm a former college basketball player. So, you know, I used to, which team did you play for? I played for, I played college for Pacific uh, Lutheran university up in the Seattle area. Okay. And, and, and so we had games and, you know, that we would travel to and stuff like that. So it was all about mental preparation, right? So you had to, you know, each game you had a strategy, right? The, the coach had worked with you all week prior to the game and you had your certain role that you had against this upcoming opponent, right? So podcasting in a lot of ways is like that, especially live streaming content where you have preparation before, you kind of know what you're going to do, you have a plan, you have an outline, whatever, and you have to mentally prepare for that. And there's a whole technique around you know, getting yourself mentally prepped for the competition, or in this case, it's it's clicking the live streaming button, and right. all of a sudden you're you're in front of you know, hundred people or twenty people or however many that people is, and it's real time, right? And what you say goes out right there. There's no taking it back. There's no like seven second pause button. I mean, some <laughs> content creators have that, right, where they can like that bleep you out if they need to, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> so you have to be really, um, on your game and, and really focused. And that's the thing about live streaming that you have to think about is, are you ready for that? Have you practiced enough in just recording, uh, and getting comfortable with the process, but it is a different mindset and you might, um, try and get involved in being a guest on some live programs. I think it will get you set up in a way that you are a mental mindset to like 
bring your A game when that red light goes on, right? That you're you're there to perform and you need to deliver on on valuable content. You need to be focused, you need to be on top of it, but you also increasingly have to be able to manage the production too because oftentimes if you're doing it alone, you have to manage all the knobs and and buttons on the screen to be able to play overlays or to to bring in a a comment from a social media platform displayed on the screen um, and then talk about that comment and just paying attention to everything requires you to be a multitasker. But sometimes that takes a little practice and sometimes that takes a little bit of feeling confident that uh, you can pull it off. And probably the first couple of shows are maybe a little bit of a disaster, but, but that may be what you have to do to actually learn how to do it. And that's right. And from experience, that. you definitely will not be confident the first few shows, no, but, but you do. I mean, unless you've done it as much as I have over the years yeah. where it's like, and it even pushes my, but I mean, after I'm done with like an hour live show, I'm like beat because it's like, you know, you're like really focused and, Sometimes you just got to step away and go take a break for a while because it's it's like playing on the basketball floor. You know, you've got four quarters that you have to perform and win the game. Yep. And if you lose the game, guess what? You're you're regretting your performance the whole next week. So it's it's kind of the, very similar. But even though I'm not, I, or I was not confident when I started live streaming, the only way to get confident is to do it. It's by doing it, right? So yeah. you have to jump in with both feet and and take a risk and just be you know it, it's not necessarily a bad approach to just be honest with your audience about what's going on you know just tell them that you know that you're new to this and and there may be things that don't go quite right but just ride along with me and I'm going to bring you the best content that I can and each episode as we move forward we'll we'll get better and better as I get better and better and that's that's a common thread with podcasting just in general is that um you know, episode one uh, is not going to be as good as episode 30. That's just kind of how it works. Um, you're going to get better. Hopefully you um, you only produce one episode at a time, and that gives you time to learn and improve from episode to episode to episode and take feedback from your audience and get um, and be open to that. Don't be overly sensitive to people saying, well, you know, your audio sounded like crap and and get in there and see if you can improve it. Yeah, definitely. You talked a little bit about AI, and that's a huge part of the future of podcasting we're living today. Um, what else, wh where else do you see the future of this audio video podcasting convergence? Where, where, where will it take us? I think it's going to increasingly move towards video. Uh, I think that's that's the pattern that we're seeing um, increasingly. Um, I'm not 100% sure about what the future of audio is. Um, in the bigger picture of things, I think that there will always be a certain amount of consumption of audio because just like you said earlier, um, th there's just so many more places where it can be consumed than video. So... So I think that the pattern going forward is increasingly content creators are going to have tools that are easier and easier to use. And we're already starting to see some of that stuff happen. Platforms like a Nomano or whatever that are using AI tools, cloud, cloud production tools, things like that, that can um, audio process the audio, So which means you can record your content pretty much anywhere. I mean, you don't need special equipment or... I mean, special microphones and mixers and all these wires and all this kind of things. You can just have this kind of very simple lavalier type device clip on and voice it. Uh, and then it's done. It goes up to the cloud. It gets voice processed. It sounds like you're in a studio, but you're outside by a waterfall, you know, or you were in, in other places. And we're starting to see those kind of technologies start to take hold. And so it, it may be very much easier, and I think this also, this move towards creating content with your mobile device is increasingly going to become um, more and more a thing as well. Uh, and then these AI tools will augment kind of that production and clean them up and um, optimize them and create different experiences and stuff with it more automatically. Now, the content creator still needs to be in charge of the process, and if the AI doesn't do the right job. I, I'm a firm believer that the AI needs to be able to be modified and and you 
give it your creative input and don't be 100% reliant on any kind of AI tools. Always review what it does, the output that it creates. Um, you know, increasingly, we're going to be probably using very, very good uh, voice cloning tools. Um, we're already seeing that r right now as, as, as a way to edit audio. So you can add audio to um, a, a piece of content. Yep. with your voice without actually having to use your voice. You just type it in and, even and it will create it. And your face and your mouth moving according to those words you typed in. Exactly. You, you could use a, a younger version of yourself or something like that, or there's all sorts of things that this is going to unlock. You know, it, it could create a lot of, you know, this whole concept of deep fakes and things like that, um, yeah. I think is a, is a realistic concern, um, you know, and it's going to be hard for us sometimes to, know what's 100% real and what's been created for us. Um, and and I, I'm not sure exactly how we're going to mitigate that um, quite yet. I'm not sure that anybody's really kind of like if there's going to be laws or if there's going to be some sort of rules around identification or um, you know, labeling this as AI generated or something. Is there going to be some rules around that um, that will preserve the integrity of human created content like we're doing right now. Thank you for being with us today and for sharing your time and wisdom with us. Uh, if our audience enjoyed this and they want to learn more about you and your products and services, what are the best ways for them to do that? Well, I have a website at uh, uh, robgreenlee.com and that's G-R-E-E-N-L-E-E.com, Rob Greenlee. And I'm on Twitter as well or X um, at Rob Greenlee, my, my name. So you can actually find me by my name on pretty much all the social platforms, whether it be Instagram, on YouTube, you can see a bunch of the content that I'm I'm making over on YouTube as well at Rob Greenlee, and and I I have a a show on the Streamyard channel. Uh, it's called Podcast Tips with Rob Greenlee, and that's uh, typically every Thursday at 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific, and the new media shows live Wednesday at 3 p.m. Uh, Eastern. And that would be noon Pacific. So, and that's at uh, newmediashow.com. So those are two of the, about the five shows that I'm involved in. I could be here for a long time telling you all the stuff I'm working on, but that's a good summary. With everything you have going on, thanks for making time and being here. Yeah, well, thank you, Nathan, and, and good luck with your, your projects as well. I really appreciate that. Here are my key takeaways from this episode. Number one, podcasting encompassing both audio and video is a new... It's a return to the early days of the medium's beginnings. Number two, audiences are coming to perceive and define podcasts more by convenient content delivery over rigid technical classifications. Number three, each format, whether audio or video, has unique benefits. Strategically converge and diversify where it aligns to your show goals. Number four, take small incremental steps to get started converging versus overthinking perfection of every production detail, especially when just beginning. Number five, live interactions facilitate connections. Inviting audiences into the behind the scenes process can uniquely build skills and rapport. And number six, ongoing AI advancements promise to continue simplifying and automating multi-format publishing workflows in the years ahead. If you're looking for a great all-in-one podcasting platform with 35 integrated modules to help you create, grow, and monetize your podcast, please take a look at podup.com where you can get a free trial. Thanks for joining me for this episode, and I wish you success with the convergence of audio and video for your podcast.